Competency Works. Co-founded Competency Works and wanted to welcome everyone to today's webinar. The uh, title of today's webinar is Competency Education, and we're going to reflect on the field as competency-based education is emerging in and across the United States. This is a national perspective of the growth and development, key trends, uh, and issues. We're also going to highlight future directions in the field. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. The learning goals for today and the agenda of what we're covering is to examine what is competency education and how does it differ, how does it contrast from the traditional K-12 education system. We're going to examine where the field really um, where the field really emerged, where we got started at Competency Works, and how we see the field evolving, um, where we are now in the fall of 2017. We're going to take a look at how policy across the United States is advancing, both at the state and federal level, and we're going to explore how our understanding of competency education is deepening, some of the key lessons learned and critical issues that need to be addressed in the field. Last, we're going to highlight future directions for the K-12 education competency-based learning field. With that, I would like to turn it over to Chris Sturgis to begin with what is competency-based education. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Okay, what is competency education, everyone? Um, a lot of folks of you, of folks here are deeply in it, and there's a lot of folks who are newbies, so we always take the time. So this is our working definition, uh, which includes five elements, and all five elements are important. Um, this was developed in 2011 with 100 innovators in the field, both policy and practitioners, and it was developed because we had realized there were pockets of innovation, around the country and that people were using different language, which we continue today, mastery-based, performance-based, proficiency-based, and competency-based. And these five elements are important to think about, and each one challenges us to think about a different culture and a different structure for schools. So the first is that students advance upon demonstrated mastery. Many people interpret this to be about flexible pacing, and in fact, that was never actually our intent. The intent was the really big idea of competency-based education, which is that all students would be successful in learning. And instead of having some kids learning and going into college and some kids learning some things and going on to factories and some kids not learning very much and supposedly going to the farm or finding a job, that, of course, is not our economy anymore, and every student's got to learn. So the idea is that kids might take more time, and during that time they would get more instructional support to keep learning if they had gaps or if it was harder for them. And if students were really strong in one subject and maybe not as much in the other, they might advance in one, but they might spend more time on the one where they're weaker. So it was much more about organizing the advancement based on students' learning and then also making sure that schools and districts were doing whatever it took to help kids um, be successful. The second one, competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that empower students. There's a lot in this. One important part of this is that it's transparent. We've ended up really understanding that transparent, transparency is one of the most important design principles and has implications throughout the competency-based systems. It allows teachers to calibrate uh, their understanding of proficiency. It allows students to be empowered, to be able to know what it is they're supposed to be working on, what it looks like to be proficient, and what they need in order to move forward. Uh, so that's a very, very important part of the system and, and builds out what's now called the learning continuums that you can find in schools. The third, the assessment's meaningful and a positive learning experience means that we return assessment to assessment for learning. We return it to uh, its important place in the cycle of learning, rather than only having it related to accountability. So formative assessment becomes much more important because feedback is so necessary for any kind of learning. 
students receive timely and differentiated support. This is kind of a no-brainer, but we actually had forgotten to do this in our traditional systems. Uh, basically, when students are struggling, it's good to struggle. They need to kind of struggle on their own for a little bit. But if they're not progressing, then they need to get support. And they need to get support that's based on where they're having misconceptions. And so this really in, um, gets interpreted by schools right now in terms of flex hours during the day, that there's an hour during the day that students can go to the teacher that they that can help them. They can work on their um, homework, which is really either practice or being showing evidence of their learning. And we don't anymore wait until kids fail in order to give them remediation. It's really built in right as a just-in-time capacity. And students develop and apply a broad set of skills and dispositions. Susan's going to be talking about this more later on in the webinar, but this really is about that it's not just academic standards. We also want to make sure that kids are really developing those higher order skills they're going to need uh, it, for college and career and for life, and they're really going to develop those lifelong learning skills, that growth mindset, the habits of work, the social emotional skills, that metacognitive um, skills that allow them to become really empowered lifelong learners. So that's our five elements. And please be asking questions in the um, chat room or sharing your insights, and Susan um, and Natalie can be responding, or I know we have a lot of other experts in the room, so they can be responding as well. So what we have found is that it helps a lot to understand the traditional system, um, before, if you're going to really understand the competency-based system. And these are some of the problems that are in the traditional system. Uh, that get in our way. So first of all, it's essentially built on what you might call an institutional fixed mindset. It has an idea that intelligence cannot be changed or shaped. Teachers have very little efficacy if you really can't change intelligence. Uh, and so it, it gets in our way if you really don't think that kids can actually learn that much, that some kids are smart and some kids aren't. And in fact, you can argue that that would be a basis for the inequity that we see in our current system. It's time-based. We've talked about that. Um, uh, it depends on extrinsic motivation. It really depends on that 100-point scores and that hoping that students will really respond to that. And of course, the top 10% do respond to extrinsic motivation of points. But that bottom 90%, it doesn't, it's not very powerful if you never think you, that you can be at the top. It has very high variability in how teachers determine proficiency. Teachers have a great deal of um, control over what they determine to be proficient, how they shape their grading, and they can pass students on with different grades and at different levels. And of course, what that means is the teacher in the next grade level is receiving students who have tons of gaps in their um, in their uh, in, in their skills. And so, what's interesting about that, of course, is then we're actually setting up teachers for, if not failure, to really struggle themselves when they have students with so many different levels of proficiency in their classroom. And then the traditional systems really organize about efficiency, not effectiveness, but efficiency. It, it, and it's efficiency in delivering curriculum. Stu teachers deliver the curriculum, and then students are supposed to learn it, and if they don't, guess what? We pass them on. So that's the traditional system. So taking a minute to think about competency-based education, it's built much more upon a growth mindset. It's structured around the idea of all children can learn, should learn, and that there are things that we can do to help them um, become better learners. It's mastery-based, but of course, there's still time-bound targets. We're trying to get students from entering kindergarten all the way to graduation and a set of um, skills. And so pacing becomes very important, and it's an active part of competency-based schools. It's not student paced. It, there's a, a lot of attention to pace and progress, and what is it going to take to help kids move forward. It's really designed around fostering intrinsic motivation and what we know about engagement and motivation. It builds educator cap capacity. One of the most exciting things is after a year of implementation, teachers are talking with each other about what is proficiency. Um, is the instruction aligned to the standards? Is, are the assessments aligned to the standards? And really sharing different instructional strategies about how to best help kids learn. And then it's organized um, personalized learning. So let's look about how competency ed and personalization go hand in hand. Now personalization has lots of different meanings. 
um, these days, but we really focus on the part where it relates to motivation and engagement, that you stay focused on what it will, um, how you use students' interests and passions to engage them, um, how to build student agency so that they can be more empowered, and um, what we perceive is technology as a tool that can be used and should be used in ways that are based upon the learning sciences that complement the overall pedagogical uh, principles of the school. So we really believe that personalization go hand in hand. Um, and what you can see in this picture is that you might want to think of this as the roots, as the cultures, values, and assumptions of competency-based education, what is good for learners, transparency, empowering, the things we've talked about. Then the trunk and the branches are those five elements that really hold it up. That's the structure. And then you can think about the leaves as different personalized approaches. It might be using high interest. It might be choice or voice or learning plans or focusing on the habits of work. But those are all helping to engage and motivate kids and really meet them where they are. Now, just to let you know that this fall, we are going to take some time to um, create a logic model for competency-based education, and we are going to take um, some time to revise and strengthen the working definition. So you will be seeing a slightly different definition in the future. Okay, so now I'm going to keep going. Um, and what we're going to start to talk about is where we started and where we are now. And this is to give some background about the process of um, and how competency ed is advancing. So first of all, I just want to say that there are many efforts that have been leading up to competency-based education, and certainly Benjamin Bloom is you know, one of those major stepping stones in this work. But we understand competency-based education as a district or school-wide reform. And in doing that, we take a step forward from what had been perceived as solely classroom um, approaches. And so when we tell the story of competency-based education, we really start with 1994 when Chugach School District, um, in response to the Native Alaskan communities that they were serving, uh, began to transform their school district. And you can find um, Natalie. If Natalie hasn't, she'll add a link where you can find out more about Chugach. So that was on one side of our continent. On the other, Boston Day and Evening and Diploma Plus were also beginning to innovate, actually focusing much more on dropout recovery and how you really focused a school on the skills and learning that kids needed, not on just accruing credits. We also then saw, just a little bit later, some state policy innovators. We saw Oregon introduce um, proficiency-based credits, Rhode Island introduced a proficiency-based diploma, and New Hampshire, of course, uh, created a full-out competency-based credit and diploma um, policy and are continuing to be, um, what is this, 12 years later, moving towards that uh, promise and vision. So as I said, um, when we started, which was about 2010, with the support of the Nellie May Education Foundation, what we found were that there were these pockets of innovation. Um, people were doing actually very similar strategies, but using very different language. And there was a few technical assistance providers, and there was no one national organization or um, that was promoting or being able to lift these uh, folks up, these innovators up. So they were really isolated. So Susan and I met, and then we started working with the Nellie May Education Foundation. We did a scan of the field. And then in 2011, we had the first summit with 100 innovators. And that's where we really defined the, um, what it is, what competency-based education is. We identified what major issues were that we were going to need to work on. And we began to form this kind of network strategy of being able to um, make sure that we were always learning from the field, lifting up practice to inform policy, and we launched competency works as a technique and a strategy to be as fast as we could in responding to the um, both the lessons learned from the field and the needs of the field. And then what we've seen um, in 2012 and 2013 is an increased attention to proficiency-based diplomas, and there's certainly a lot of conversation going on about that today, too. So. It's very hard um, to 
be able to describe the stages of development when you're in the midst of the work itself. But here's our first cut on this. As I described in 1994, there were, so the top level um, is practice, the schools and the districts, and the bottom level is policy, so, so you can separate those two. So early innovators, and then we moved to this place where we saw what I would only call educator-driven um, change, which was there were districts operating without any state policy, just turning to competency-based ed, creating it, innovating it, because it was they were tired of what the traditional system was forcing them to do. No matter what they did, they kept reproducing these low achievement gains. And what they started to realize is they needed a system that was really based on what's best for kids, what's really best on the learning sciences. And so we saw Lindsay and Westminster, it used to be called Adams 50, and the main cohort for um, customized learning, all beginning to do these, make these changes on their own. And then we went, we saw a lot of new model development starting about 2012, and it's continuing now with the XQ schools. And these models may or may not include competency-based education as a part of their work, but some of the schools have that in their own design principles. But what we're also seeing is many of those new models inching towards competency-based ed. And then about 2015, 14, and 15, we started to see larger districts start to try to tackle this. And this is an important issue because in, earlier we had seen more either rural or inner ring suburbs um, beginning to innovate around competency ed. And the larger, middle size and larger districts have a challenge, which is it's not just an implementation um, strategy they need. They need implementation and scaling. How do you reach all the schools? And so um, Henry County, Charleston, District 51, a number of them started to move in this direct direction. They're taking different courses. They're hitting different bumps. Um, and some have kind of stopped a little bit, taken a step backwards. So there's a lot of lessons to be gathered from this work. And then in New York City, we saw the Mastery Collaborative develop, which now has over 10% of the high schools, and that's a voluntary effort. And right now, what we're seeing is a lot of interest and a lot of new entry points. And what we don't know is what the implications are going to be, and we'll talk about that later. And in terms of policy, um, we've tried to kind of separate out these waves. So we talked about the first wave of car, um, in New Hampshire and Rhode Island, Oregon, the second one, um, Maine, created the proficiency-based diploma. Oregon started to have a stronger clarity about what it meant to be proficient. Colorado introduced proficiency-based diploma. And in the third wave, what we're seeing is more efforts around pilots and innovation zones, although Vermont also has taken um, a very big step and to personalize and create a proficiency-based system. And we're now just entering this fourth wave, which is the ESSA open new opportunities. And the question is, are states and how are states going to take advantage of that? So one of the things that we're seeing right now, um, and it's just a handful of schools, but this is an area of work, I think, for all of us, is these are models that build very strong continuums of learning, very explicit, transparent um, continuums of learning with the assessments and the standards very much aligned. And then they open up so that they're having multi-age bands. They're, they're organizing around higher order skills. They're focusing on growth. And some are actually beginning to have nonlinear approaches. So this also is a new area of work, I think, for all of us to be paying attention to. What we do see is that um, most districts and schools are using several common design principles, which we'll be writing about and, and releasing um, the revised paper on quality uh, at the end of this year, and we'll talk about this, but that there are variations about how they are implementing these design principles. Some of them are which skills they're focusing on, are they focusing on habits of work? Are they focusing on social emotional learning? Um, is it only higher order skills? Is it um, solely the academic state standards? As I said, they're organizing around age and skills differently. Some are really emphasizing applying knowledge much more than others. Um, meeting students where they are is an area of work that we think is really important. Some are really thinking about the full holistic child, about how they're progressing developmentally and academically, 
and also in terms of their lifelong learning skills. But other schools, quite honestly, are only uh, continue to deliver curriculum, grade level curriculum, and that's something we need to um, figure that part out. Uh, we're really starting to think more deeply about new metrics for growth, and we're also seeing a lot of different types of grading practices that range from basically keeping the current traditional grading systems of points and A through F to um, very, very, um, I'm not sure, innovative ones, but I would call them aligned, that they're deeply, deeply aligned with the values and the focus of learning. And so they really focus on how students are progressing. And then we're seeing more conversation these days about reciprocal accountability, which is, yes, we, it's about embedding accountability into the district and schools, but it's when there's, when people take responsibility, they also need support. We always need to support learning for the adults and for the students. So where are we right now? This is a very rough kind of quick um, summary, which is, Last year, we thought we had 4%. We were confident that we had 4% of the districts in the United States converting to competency-based ed. It's now been expanding so rapidly, but we can't track it very well. So we're guessing it's somewhere between 6 to 10%. Um, and what's, what's happening is that there's a lot of schools that are starting, instead of starting with a big commitment and a full implementation, they're using different entry points and trying to um, take it step by step. We do not know if that approach is going to work or not, but what it's done is increased a lot of schools, um, increased the number of schools talking and thinking about competency-based ed. We're continuing to see waves of improvement in those districts that are continuing um, to implement. And so uh, one of, again, another area of work is to really understand those waves of improvement and see if we can expedite that process. We have um, a few states moving towards scale with the assumption that everybody should be converting or planning. And we're getting a better and better understanding about how personalized learning and competency-based education fit together and how important it is to have both. In terms of concerns about kind of what's happening, we still have a limited number of exemplars of what we would call high-quality models. So we can point to models that are pretty well developed but they're not always either willing or have data that supports it making a difference. Now, part of this is the state accountability systems that are really focused on grade level curriculum because it's not capturing the growth of, of students the way we would expect in a competency-based system. But it is something that we're worried about because it, it, it is possible we don't have it right yet. We all need to be really um, strong critical friends with each other to make sure that we're doing the very best practices and the combination of the very best practices that we know out there. Um, again, uh, about this, the issue about the top-down dynamics, which is in where states where it's expected that everyone become competency-based, um, you'll read about in the local paper a superintendent saying, well, we're doing this because the state requires it. They're not doing it because it's best for kids. So right off the bat, you've got a question. Shouldn't they be committed in wanting to do this because it's best for kids? Um, and so that may be creating some implementation issues. And again, the entry points um, have created some uh, issues around sh either shallow design or piecemeal um, implementation. And it's hard to know if they're moving in a direction that's going to actually end up in a fully developed competency-based system. And then there's a great report uh, by AIR about looking under the hood, which starts to uh, illuminate some of this. We are definitely paying attention to what's going on with special populations and students with gaps. We need to make sure that they are fully benefiting from the system and, and understand what it takes to make sure that they do. And there is a concern that some traditional patterns are continuing. Most schools, as I said, are still delivering grade level curriculum, and there's little advancement beyond the grade level. So now I'm going to move fairly quickly to building the field. And if you also go to Com um, Competency Works, there is a, um, the there's a blog with this information. So we, every year, there's more and more organizations um, joining in, putting competency-based ed on their agendas. This is not a complete list. I'm happy to add other people's logo if you're working in this field. Uh, but it's been a very collaborative um, set of organizations in the field, and it's been really, the, I think, the strength, the, basically the humbleness, humility it takes to always be a learner is something that 
moves through the entire field. Um, the greatest weakness is that we developed uh, without enough diversity in our uh, leadership and in our networks and in our, these organizations. And it's really up to all of us to correct this so that we are bringing all the strength of the racial, cultural diversity of America to this um, work together. And um, hopefully every organization here and everybody in this webinar will recommit to this. Um, it really will require clarifying our values, changing our processes, and just staying, being very results oriented to make sure that we are actually an inclusive field and not an exclusive one. And then what you'll find on the blog today is pictures of all the reports, but when Susan and I started, there were um, there was one book, Delivering the Promise, and there was one wonderful piece um, that American Youth Policy Forum had produced um, from um, Camille Farrington and others uh, that was looked at competency-based education. But now we have 111 reports and books and at least two exciting new books coming out this summer. So there's just a lot of um, expansion. Okay, Susan, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great, Chris. Thank you so much. And I wanted to point out we had a couple of questions, one from Shireen and one from Ken, related to competency-based education grading. Um, and another question from Heather on after-school and summer learning programs as partners with CBE. Do you want to hold those questions for the end or answer in the chat room while um, I uh, start to cover policy? I will do, I will answer them in the chat room because I over talked by three minutes, so you can keep going. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Chris, for that great overview of the developments in the field. Uh, I just want to thank all of the educators, practitioners, researchers who have contributed to uh, so many uh, developments across the field. It is really complex work to move from our traditional system that is fixed based on time with variable amounts of learning for students towards this transformation for a system that is competency-based that ensures that all students get what they need. Um, this, this is a massive lift, and I just want to take a moment to express my, my gratitude. Uh, Chris pointed out, when we think about how policy is advancing, I think we need to take a step back and say, it is true that schools can get started without supportive state policy in developing personalized learning approaches and in starting to develop competency-based learning systems and structures as a foundation to really focus on student learning. However, when those school leaders and those educators are deeply engaged in the design and start to develop what I would describe as a more fully developed competency-based learning system, you are going to start running into these policy barriers in a, in a significant way. And when you go from just piloting towards trying to implement at scale, you start running into key issues. So the idea that you can get started without the support of policy is important uh, because those innovators starting to work on developing more personalized learning approaches and trying to move to competency-based systems. But the system really needs to be transformed to shift to be designed for students and doing what's best for students and student-centered learning. And if you just think fundamentally how our current system allows students to move on from one grade level to the next with these huge gaps, uh, the, the gaps that Chris talked about, we know we have lots of students coming into ninth grade, maybe reading at a fourth grade level, fifth grade level, and, and on and on. These huge gaps persist in our system. The key idea here, and this is important for policy, is let's transform to a system designed around all student reaches, reaching high expectations and having a range of academic knowledge and skills. So in that context, let's take a look. Back in 2012, here is our map of the United States in a snapshot of states that had either 
started with policy, developed policy for credit flexibility, or um, deeper, more advanced policy and competency-based debt, which is in the red. If you look at 2017, in just five years, we have more than 43 states with um, have created policy to support and enable competency-based education. This is significant for the field of K-12 education. So it is advancing. There is more room for uh, practitioners, leaders, educators to get started. And then with the passage in 2015 of the Every Student Succeeds Act, a great deal of flexibility to state leaders to really think about how they could move forward with broader goals, a deeper, a deeper commitment to continuous improvement, moving away from compliance and their child left behind towards continuous improvement, and to help support what would new policy frameworks that support competency-based education systems look like. Uh, so these highlights are from a report that we published on meeting the promise or potential in ESFA for state policy to support competency-based learning, personalized learning. Um, it, it's offering these opportunities. Now, quite frankly, it is 2017, and this is the year that state plans for ASA are due. Um, we are not seeing the kind of movement forward away from NCLB-type accountability systems towards ones that are um, more holistic, include multiple measures, focus on the skills and habits. Um, so there was an opportunity, and there is an ongoing opportunity under ESSA, and states maybe are getting started with their, their um, current state plans in 2017, but please know, for all of you working in the field, there is an opportunity for state leaders to amend their plans and this was written in by Congress in the ESSA to help create a model or a framework that will allow for continuous improvement as we start to innovate into next-gen accountability models. This gives states a chance to think about how they might redesign systems of assessments, and I would say for learning and better aligned to student-centered learning than we have had over the last decade. And it also gives us a chance to really rethink how we can build educator capacity and support a next generation educator and leader workforce, including uh, modern innovations in competency-based education. So you can get more information um, on these different areas on how we can help supportive policy to continue um, to create personalized and competency-based education systems. But one of the key concepts in state policy is trying to help our policy leaders think about how we might create better coherence. Um, there's a lot of focus in our system on two very important foundations of literacy and mathematics. Those continue to be critical, but not enough. So those are necessary but not sufficient. So you're seeing states and you're seeing communities trying to have a conversation around what would it look like to have better system, K-12 education system coherence, across the areas that would support our educators and support our students in being successful for college careers and life in the future. And that starts with at the heart of it in redefining student success and getting clear about the purpose of our education systems locally and at the state level, what values, what culture that means, then, and only then, rethinking what accountability might look like with metrics and measures. What does that need to look like at the state level? What does that need to look like at the local level with communities? What does that need to look like in individual schools? The competency-based education should provide far more transparency on where every student is in their learning and learning pathway because you can see just where they are and what they've demonstrated mastery with evidence of work. And with that is a need for transforming our systems for the educator and school leader workforce to manage competency-based systems 
and also to have a much deeper focus on, on areas like building educator capacity for performance assessment and allowing multiple pathways. Well, last, this is going to challenge our current framework and come to the box that we've been in for so long around, quote, a single assessment model to redesign systems, plural, of assessments, plural, to better align with student-centered learning. And this is not about lowering or having different standards. It's about holding all students to the same high expectations for college readiness and career readiness it's a chance for realigning. So in state policy, there are a number of these entry points that we're seeing to create competency-based systems. And some of the most promising for states getting started are to create innovation zones for districts that are starting to take on the work. And they can help identify or flag the policy barriers in the way. States are uh, setting up competency-based ed task forces to try to identify uh, what's the best pathway in for uh, practitioners, districts, schools in the state, as well as credit flexibility regulations. And a number of states now are starting competency-based pilot programs, and some even have some funding attached to early innovators for planning for professional development and getting started. So there's more on this information on the Competency Works and iNACL website. But fundamentally, this is an opportunity to say if we're going to transform the education system around learning in a competency-based learning system, what do students need to know and be able to do? What do we want a profile of a graduate to look like? So redefining student success is central and engaging communities, communities that for many years now have been frozen out by the very restrictive guidelines that the federal government has set for defining student success merely as math and reading. Again, necessary but not sufficient. To have a deep conversation across communities on what do we want our students to know and be able to do, and to have the profile of a graduate meaningful drive system redesign conversation. And what's great is this is starting to happen in some states. So two quick examples in Virginia. They have a profile of a Virginia graduate. This is led by educators and school districts that wanted to really rethink what the goals and purposes of the system are. And you can say they include content knowledge as a central foundation, but also the development of skills, civic responsibility, and career exploration. They have different domains, these four different domains, and undergirding all of them is a focus on critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. There's another example of South Carolina working on the profile of a graduate, and they're focused, yes, on the knowledge of a central uh, foundation, but also on the skills, career, and life success characteristics. We're starting to drive very different conversations in this state. And while they may getting started with their state plan for ESSA this year in Virginia and South Carolina, it is driving really different conversations around what reciprocal accountability in their community across schools might look like with those broader definitions. What does the federal government need to know? What do state governments need to know to hold accountability, to maintain guardrails, and focus on equity but we should have far greater data in rethinking um, in our competency-based education systems that can help drive systems change, help us think differently about what multiple measures might look like, assessments for learning, and how we drive continuous improvement across the system. So assessments for and of learning are key, and I just wanted to highlight there's a current um, project that's being led by the Center for Innovation and Education um, and out of the Next Generation Learning Challenges grantees, where they have states and districts working on assessments for and of learning, trying to pilot what some new model, uh, pilot and highlight new models. We also uh, know that in the current um, ESSA law, 
that now a range of systems of assessment can be used. So you can focus more on formative assessments, interim assessments, as well as summative assessments for determining whether a student has met or exceeded proficiency. And assessments can include adaptive items, and this is really important. Uh, they can include performance assessments and performance tests. The last piece I wanted to point out is that several of you might be familiar with in ESSA, there was language to allow for an innovative accountability and assessment pilot. Um, that pilot application has not yet been developed by the U.S. Department of Education, but we do expect to see that in the next year. Um, the regulations for this pilot that were created in 2016 were left intact by the administration, and we expect to see um, the opportunity for applying to this innovative accountability and assessment pilot come here. In a nutshell, what it means is if you have a group of districts that are advanced in personalized learning or competency-based ed, um, you can try out new models of assessment and accountability that aren't 100% statewide like the overall ESSA requirement, which means you can have a group of districts piloting competency-based models of accountability and assessment with a plan to scale that statewide. It's a really interesting provision in the law, um, not yet been carried out, but we hope to see that in the next year, and we'll be blogging about that with more information to come. And finally, really important, with ESSA removing highly qualified teacher provisions, there is an opportunity to really think at a systems level about what next generation educator workforce systems might look like. Can we focus on a competency-based model for educators and for leaders? And for all of you from higher ed on this webinar, I just want to give a shout out. There are some significant opportunities to better align higher ed and K-12 education and competency-based. You can think about how micro-credentialing might work for the skills and knowledge needed for educators and for leaders leading this work, better job embedded professional development opportunities, multiple pathways for credentials, and for the state leaders on the call really thinking differently about what a competency-based credential for the adults in our system might look like. So interesting opportunities abound. The states are leading the way. Uh, by creating innovation zones and really giving more flexibility to schools and districts to engage in the work. This is a bottom-up movement, and I would say in a reform, this is being led and designed by educators, um, practitioners across the field. So here's a summary. At the federal level, you have the state plan for ESSA due in 2017. You might expect to see the innovative assessment pilots in 2018. But don't forget, there's an opportunity in the future to amend state plans and continue to innovate the model for continuous improvement. And that is going to be important for, for districts, for states, for schools advancing competency-based ed. Well, we continue to see more states creating innovation zones, competency-based ed pilots, and exploring um, how, what the pathway is for their state as well as more states focusing on how to develop systems to build capacity for performance assessment as a key part, not just of their accountability system, but of a move to students creating evidence and portfolios and exhibitions of their work. And that's all important for competency, they said, but ultimately it's important for students and their future success in a very rapidly changing world where it's key that they have the skills and the knowledge they need to be successful. So Chris, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Um, so Susan, uh, Pat Simmons had a question about what is the process states are using to create graduate profiles, if you could chat with her in the chat room. Okay, everybody, so we um, are slipping on our time, so I'm going to zip through this, but what I'm promising is by the end of this week, um, everything we're going to say here today um, will also be written about on blogs on competency work, so you can go there and get more information. 
And of course, this webinar will be available too, but because we're going to go quickly, um, I'll make sure that I write in detail on the blog. Um, so what we're really talking about, our, uh, we are constantly learning, constantly learning, and so is everybody is in the field. And it's very difficult to try to collect all those lessons learned, but here's some of them that have really shaped our work as we go forward and run competency works. And I mentioned the issue of diversity. Um, it's important. It requires intentionality. And that is our number one lesson and the one that we hold um, in our hearts all the time. We've really learned that competency-based education has to be thought of as much as a cultural change as a structural change. And that the, the focus on agency empowerment for both students and teachers and all the adults in the system is really important. If we only have a structural change without the culture, we do not believe that we will um, make, really be able to hold the promise of competency-based ed, and students will not benefit in the way they need to. Um, related to number one, we are becoming more focused on actually confronting institutional practices and bias that lead to inequity. We've been really, we thought that we could talk about and help people learn about competency-based education by talking about the positive and what people are doing. But again, the same way we learned that we have to talk about the traditional system to be able to understand competency ed, we all really have to be able to become each other's critical friends to confront um, practices that are problematic for children. One of the interesting, number four is probably my personal biggest learning of this last six months, which is when schools and districts figure out what their pedagogy is, when they build a shared understanding of teaching and learning that's based on the learning sciences and, and the research on engagement and motivation, everything goes more smoothly. I don't care if you're implementing blended learning or deeper learning or competency-based education, but when you are clear about your pedagogy, the, the rest will kind of fall into place. If you are not, then when you, after you implement the competency-based structure, then there's a two or three year period of time where the school starts to have these conversations about instruction, assessment, aligning it, engagement, and motivation. And I think, although it's a very organic and natural process, it does take a long time. Um, as Susan's been talking, the issue of thinking about students holistically and the definition of student success holistically and really focusing on that lifelong learning and the habits of work much earlier in the process of implementation will make a different difference. Too many schools wait until the second or third year to start talking about habits of work, but in fact, if you're not talking about those lifelong learning skills, growth mindset, habits of work, SEL, up front, then it's very difficult to have students um, really thrive in a personalized setting um, where they're able to really own their education. Um, we've been having this conversation in the chat room. Although some schools do it, in most cases we recommend not starting with changes in grading until you have the culture and infrastructure in place. When schools start with grading, um, without all the other pieces in place, and there is a blog, which I will get the link when I stop talking, um, about what needs to be in place for standards-based grading. Um, meeting students where they are is a much more complicated topic than we ever understood. It needs to be thought about holistically. It needs to be thought about in terms of age, the size of the gaps, um, where the other students are in the classroom, and also within different domains, there may be different responses. But what we have to get really good at is not just saying, oh, I'm scaffolding, but we have to be clear about in what way are you scaffolding? Are you actually building the skills that the kids have the gaps in, or is it really just access to a curriculum? Because we want the kids to have the skills they need for higher level courses, and we have to take the time. We have to, the adults and the school has to take the time to make sure they fill those gaps. Um, and Susan, this one goes to you, I think. Yes, it is. Great. So I will be quick. We just talked about, about how you can begin without a completely supportive state policy contact, but you will run into these barriers, and it is absolutely necessary for scaling and, and success. Um, it's really necessary to support advanced competency-based practices for mature implementation. So it's important um, from the insights and lessons learned. I would describe the more advanced school districts are experiencing this, 
this um, difficulty with accountability because accountability is still largely um, very much defined like it was in the NCLB era of age-based, grade-based Co cohorts, and there are ways that you can um, get valid and reliable information along a learning continuum or learning progression for each student where you have far better and more transparent data. And I would argue you could actually see um, a larger achievement gap for uh, groups of students that would allow us to fo more focus much more deeply on, on how um, how large uh, the equity gaps, the achievement gaps are, and get very serious about adjusting equity. Um, and that's absolutely critical. So accountability, those that are more advanced in running competency-based education systems are essentially running uh, two parallel systems of accountability. One that is focused on uh, what is in state regulation, and the other, which is to have far better data about how their students are doing for their uh, reporting internally and to their community. So there can be an aspect of reciprocal accountability with the community and even with the state that doesn't quite exist um, that we would hope to see in a more fully developed system. Other big uh, lessons learned and insights on policy there's still, even when there are innovation zones in many states, time-based regulations for school calendars, line of sight restrictions in Illinois and Chicago, where if we really are talking about any time, anywhere learning, and that can be after school and in museums and, and place-based and internships, line of sight restrictions uh, really limit uh, where learning can happen. So, Ongoing challenge of meeting students where they are. There was a comment in the chat room earlier about we have a very limited notion in a traditional system of actually identifying how we meet students where they are. And um, what we see in more advanced education systems around the globe is, one, this broader definition of success in meeting students where they are academically, but also more holistically from um, from many different elements, uh, social and emotional learning. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. We talked about getting really clear about um, thinking in advanced models and lessons learned about we, we need to have an honest conversation in this country about what a credential means, like what does a high school diploma actually mean as we have all of this pressure to increase graduation rates. We see that students are still unprepared, and the remediation rates, even for basic math and reading and writing when they go to college, um, is not resulting in success in college and successful college completion outcomes while having a really honest conversation about what a diploma means and what a credential means across our elementary and secondary system is, uh, I think, of utmost importance. and. Also getting a lot deeper on what it takes to go from a pilot to scaling district-wide and even statewide. Well, those are the key insights that we've had just in the last year around competency-based systems and policy. Hi, everybody. So we were going to have a discussion, but because um, of where we are. What I'm going to ask is in the chat room, what are your lessons learned about competency-based ed, big or small? But let's share them among each other, and I will write a blog based on what you guys share. So um, what I want to talk about right now is about two years ago, when we did this reflection on the field, we realized that, yes, the field is expanding, and it continues to expand, and it seems to be expanding even faster. But there were issues and challenges that were going to actually undermine us if we didn't get them right. And so the first one was equity. Were we really creating schools? We always talk about equity is at the center of competency-based ed. And yes, the idea of the structure makes a lot of sense. But the fact of the matter is we don't intentionally, in everything we do, make sure that the historically underserved kids are not only doing better in terms of academic achievement, but actually thriving and really developing their potential, um, their aptitudes, their interests. Uh, if we're not helping them become the strongest lifelong learners they can possibly be, 
what good are we, right? If we're not really making a difference in the lives of, of people who've been actually um, allowed to kind of struggle behind or drop out of school historically, then what, why are we doing this? So the equity issue became very, very important. Equally as important and related to it was quality. And some of this, again, has to do with what happens when there's more of a top-down expectation that schools become competency-based and the multiple entry points. But we're seeing all different types of schools saying, I do this practice, therefore I'm competency-based. And when we need to, we realize, to really build up a very strong understanding and shared understanding of quality and begin to have conversations. So um, the third one, which we've talked about, is meeting students where they are. If we're not meeting students are where they are, and if we're just delivering curriculum, Based on their age, we're not really helping them learn. So, how do we? How, what's that shift going to require? And then, as Susan has talked about, we really want to have these policies that are fit for purpose, that are really focused on the learning sciences and what we know about how to help students learn. And that will not only put competency education into place, but it will help sustain it. So, what we did in 2017, just in June, is we had a national summit on K-12 competency-based education. We had a very participatory process, which I'm not going to describe, but you can find on the website. And we created papers on each of these um, issues. We will be releasing a final paper that integrates this, and then we are going to re-release each one of these papers based on the input from the participants at the summit, so that it's really reflecting the best of what we no, and, and a couple of the papers, they're pretty significant changes, um, and that's because there was really significant um, learning, and folks at the summit were great. I am going to just touch on this. One of the things we did at the summit um, is we looked at emerging issues, and I'm not going to even, you, you can find this list in two days on competency works, so we're not going to talk about it. But emerging issues can also be challenging issues, because what could be emerging in New Hampshire um, might have already been dealt with in Colorado, right? And so it's an interesting list of, of how we learn, what we learn to do, and how we can start to um, advance the learning and, and disseminate it more quickly and effectively. So one of the things we did through the summit is to start to talk about what are the future directions? Where do we need to go as a field? And this is not a coordinated plan. This is the beginning of a discussion about what we can do. We're all going to work to strengthen diversity. We are um, going to strengthen the working definition, and we're going to create a logic model to help people understand the culture and structural changes and to help people who think that this is just about online learning um, really understand the overall logic. What became clear at the, at the summit was we re need much more um, refined communication strategies that are actually targeted to different stakeholders. And um, I talked about quality, so we, we're going to be emphasizing that. Susan mentioned higher ed. There's lots of places that higher education and K-12 can um, intersect and help each other. One is preparing leaders and educators for personalized competency-based systems through personalized competency-based education programs, building bridges across K-12 and higher ed to address the college admissions issues, including the ranking by GPA, which I'm increasingly understanding as to be a very dangerous remnant of the inequity of the traditional system. Um, but for all of you in, um, concerned about college admissions, it is worth going to Great Schools Partnership and reading up about the profes, uh, Proficiency Pledge, or it's the New England Schools Secondary Schools Consortium. Um, they have all of the New England um, colleges and universities, many of the elite colleges, all committing to will accept proficiency-based transcripts. And then Susan um, mentioned credentialing and making sure that there's alignment between K-12 and higher ed in terms of credentials. We really need much more school autonomy, and this is so important because if schools are going to really be able to be flexible and respond to students' needs, if we really want schools to be agile organizations, they cannot be operating under a load of bureaucratic rules. They need to have that autonomy. It's more important than ever. And for any of you working in this issue, you're well aware that we have an ongoing issue about the information management systems. Um, we are getting new vendors coming up with new models, which is really helpful, but we still need to get the um, older vend vendors that have already the contracts with schools and districts to start to understand what it means to have a student-centered information management system 
Inafil has a terrific um, paper on this, but it's an absolutely critical issue. Um, Susan, I'm going to just keep talking really quickly. We're going to do the featured. Um, competency Ed is not specifically about teaching and learning, but it has implications. And this issue of balancing academic knowledge and skills and content is important. As I talked about clarifying those pedagogical methods and really building up our assessment literacy, aligning higher order skills with performance-based assessments, really understanding what it means to have student agency voice and choice built into our pedagogy and into our personalized approaches, and always making sure that students have opportunities for inquiry and applied learning. So that is um, what the issues we're focusing on at Competency Works. And Susan, I'm turning it back to you to wrap us up. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And fundamentally, this starts and ends with the students. All of our decisions have to be about students and doing what's best for kids and developing a learner-centered culture. Um, that is absolutely critical. So I love this um, piece from um, Chugach School District, which started in 1994. So a shout out to Chugach and the great work they've done, they've done in student-centered learning. So to wrap up, we're happy to stay on in the chat room and continue. Uh, answering questions. Um, for more information, to share ideas, if there are topics uh, in these emerging issues and in charting the course and the major action steps, that is meant to be a collaborative list. That, that means this is our reflection on the field and some ideas for future directions. We are always open, and I want to say we're really open to sharing and working with others that are deeply committed to making this move happen, and that is researchers, that is our, our friends and colleagues in higher ed and across the entire K-12 education system in practice and in policy. We, we highlighted opportunities in policy. We have also a lot of thoughts on opportunities in practice um, and what needs to happen in terms of building more communities of innovative practice and how to do that capacity building. But with the time that we have today, I just want to thank all of you for participating, for your comments, for the discussion, and hope um, we can continue working with all of you. And please let us know what we can do to serve the field. We're lifelong learners uh, as much as anyone else is. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And enjoy the rest of your day.